Okay, so please uh, find a seat if you haven't found one yet. Uh, we need to start. Well, first of all, good evening and I guess happy spring equinox today. So it's the beginning of the spring, so that gives us some hope. Um, my name is Georgia Yellow, and in my role as Director of Research and Innovation in the School of Media and Communication today, I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing Ruth Vodak as this year's invited speaker for our annual Jay Blumler Lecture. Um, professor Vodak is uh, Emerita Distinguished Professor of Discourse Studies at Lancaster University, and she's currently affiliated to the University of Vienna as a visiting fellow in the EVM, Institute for the Wissenschaft as mentioned, which in English translates as the Institute of Human Sciences, in case you were wondering. Uh, besides various other prizes, in 1996 she was awarded the Wittgenstein Prize for Elite Researchers, and most recently the 2018 Lebensberg Prize for her lifetime achievements from the Austrian Ministry from, for Women's Affairs. Professor Bodak is past president of the Societas Linguistica Europea, a member of the British Academy of Social Sciences, and a member of the Academia Europea. Her research interests focus on discourse studies, gender studies, language and or in, um, in, and or in politics, yeah? uh, prejudice and discrimination, and ethnographic methods in uh, linguistic fieldwork. Professor Vodak has published a staggering amount of world-leading research including 10 monographs, 27 co-authored monographs, over 60 edited volumes, and approximately 400 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. Recent book publications include The Politics of Fear, What Right-Wing Populist Discourses Mean with SAGE, Analyzing Fascist Discourse, European Fascism in Talk and Text with Routledge, and Right-Wing Populism in Europe, Politics and Discourse with Bloomsbury. She is co-editor of the journals Discourse and Society, Critical Discourse Studies, and also of one of my very own favorite journals, which is a Journal of Language and Politics. Professor Vodak has held visiting professorships at Stanford University, University of Uppsala, University of Minnesota, University of East Anglia, and Georgetown University. In 2016, she was Distinguished Human Fellow at the Schumann Center of the European University Institute in Florence, which I actually visited. It's a very nice place. Um, in 2017, she held the Willy Brandt Chair at the University of Malmo in Sweden. As many of you already know, Jay Blumner's groundbreaking research on the public sphere and the role of the media and democracy has shaped the field of political communication research as we know it today. For this reason, for this annual lecture, we typically ask a distinguished speaker like Professor Vodak to ad address a wide range of issues concerning the role, operation, and outcomes of both media and communication and their relationship to public life. In today's lecture, Professor Vodak will address one of the most pressing political and social issues of our time, contestations and struggles over seemingly established collective and national identity, identities actually, in the wake of changing border and body politics, together with the rise of far-right populist parties and movements. In the lecture, um, Professor Vodak is going to illustrate these developments using the results of a, research, uh, of a recent longitudinal research project on the discursive construction of Austrian national identities. She will refer to a data set that includes political speeches, commemorative events, social media, group discussions, and also in-depth interviews, but she will then focus primarily on the media representations of asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants during the 2015 refugee crisis. As a whole, her lecture will help us reflect on the concrete implications of media discourses for everyday understandings and lived experiences of belonging, or on the other hand, exclusion, from major narratives of collective and national identity. Professor Vodak will speak for about an hour, and we will then have 20 to 25 minutes or so uh, for questions before ending with some concluding remarks by our very own Jay Blumler. After the lecture, there will also be a wine reception outside in the foyer, so please do stay afterwards for a drink or two. So without further ado, 
please help me in welcoming Professor Vodak as our invited speaker for the 2019 Jane Blunder Lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction and or also invitation, Ayela. And also thank you, Sarah, I don't, oh, here she is, for organizing our trip. And specifically, thank you to Jay for uh, being here and uh, for inspiring so many generations of scholars. And uh, I'm very honored to be invited to speak here. So what I want to do today is I will speak about, as Ayala already said, uh, belonging and exclusion in the context of border and body politics, specifically in the Austrian case, as mediated, hello, uh, in uh, the press and also other uh, television, radio broadcasts, etc. I would like to begin with a famous quote by uh, Theodor W. Adorno from the Frankfurt School, who in his famous book, Negative Dialectic, uh, wrote, identity is the prototype of ideology. So we should never think about identity and identities as something given, as something we can grasp uh, as an entity or something. It's always something which can be redefined. Uh, inclusion and exclusion, belonging and non-belonging, are arbitrarily defined by different people, by different groups, by different politics, etc. And I think in that way, this quote by Adorno frames uh, our world today very nicely, uh, where identity politics are uh, at the forefront of so many struggles. So what I want to do is first talk a bit about the project which you mentioned briefly in the introduction, uh, while focusing on body and border politics, which again I think are so amazingly important today uh, in the view of the refugee movement in, of 2015 and also beyond that. Uh, and then I will move to the Austrian context as a case study, but I'm sure you will find many ways to relate to that Austrian context in the way the rhetoric is framed, the discourse uh, debates are uh, reinforced, and the way politics instrumentalizes the media uh, for certain aims. So I think this is not just a study about Austria, it's a study about in which way media actually do uh, have an enormous influence on our uh, viewpoints, ideologies, belongings uh, in uh, nowadays Europe and beyond. And finally, I will draw some conclusions. Now, I'm very curious what uh, Jay will say about all this. So first, just a brief introduction to the three projects which we did. I'm, I'm somebody who loves working in project teams and especially in interdisciplinary teams because it's impossible to just uh, deconstruct and understand such a complex phenomenon as the refugee movement or uh, body and border politics just from a discourse analytic point of view. We do need sociologists, media studies, political science and historians to kind of work together and uh, I had the privilege to have three research projects in, with teamwork on the discursive construction of national identities, uh, always with a kind of standardized data set, uh, and looking at three years, 1995, 2005, and 2015. So in that way, it's a longitudinal study because I can say something about 20 years of uh, the socio-political impact on changing identities uh, in the Austrian context, but also beyond. And we chose those particular years because they are years of commemoration. And years of commemoration are very interesting because in those years, politicians address the nation 
at various points. There are certain days which celebrate the nation. There are days of grief. There are days of joy and so forth. Uh, for example, the 8th of May, which is the day of liberation from the Nazi regime. So 1995 was uh, 70 years, no, 50 years. 2015, 70 years. There is the Day of Liberation Holocaust Memorial Day on the 27th of January. There is the Day of the Austrian State Treaty when Austria became independent and neutral, which is May 15. And so there are certain days where political parties uh, feel that they have to say something. And these addresses to the nation tell us a lot about identity definitions. So how uh, the hegemonic identities, what Austrians are, what they're supposed to be, what they were, what the politics of the past and present are, uh, these, these moments uh, tell us a lot about identity constructions. So this is why we chose those three points in time and the standardized uh, data set, which I will come to in a minute. But I would just like to say something about the analytical categories uh, which we chose. And this thing has, mm, it works. Um, uh, we look at five dimensions. We look at the shared past. That means foundation myths. Every nation state has foundation myths. Uh, when was the first time Austria was written about, which I think was 965 or something like that in some old script, uh, or uh, other foundation myths which different political parties um, refer to. Then there's always a definition of what is good and bad in the present and what should one do in the, in the future. So there is a vision, a program for the future. Uh, fine. Then there is a lot about culture and language. And we do distinguish state, nation identities and cultural nation identities. So in the issue is German, for example, and the German culture the identifying characteristic of Austria, or is it the state, sort of the passport, certain legislation, representation, institutions, are those the defining characteristics of Austria? Finally, the typical Austrian. Who is imagined as the typical Austrian? And of course, all of you will probably have some imaginary of this Austrian, probably from Sound of Music or some uh, film or something. Um, that's not the typical Austrian. Um, but uh, we do have such prototypes. Yeah? And we have imaginaries of who's not Austrian and sort of self and other stereotypes, uh, which is important. And finally, the national body. So what's the territory? Uh, and how is that envisioned? And especially in nation states, which at one time had a much bigger territory. So interesting, uh, of course, also in the UK with the Commonwealth and uh, sort of an old empire. Well, Austria also had an old empire. And uh, the imaginary of the territory depends also on this historical point of view. So what I want to do with, uh, in this lecture today is look at the national body border and body politics, which are very different in these three points in time, and show you how uh, national identities are dynamic, are really fluid, and are multiple also in their definitions. So if we look at borders yesterday and today, uh, I do want to show you briefly the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, Habsburg Empire, uh, until 1914, which was, as you see, uh, going from Switzerland, parts of Italy, parts of ex-Yugoslavia, or now Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, parts of Romania, and uh, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, 
All of this was part and parcel of this huge Austrian-Hungarian uh, Hungarian empire, which was uh, sort of defeated in World War I and then broken down to this small country here with Vienna, yeah, this little thing here. This is uh, sort of what was left over from this big empire. And that was a trauma, of course, a collective national trauma, which certainly had an impact on the time between the two world wars. But this is not what I want to talk about today, but it is something which one has to reflect on looking at national identities. Now, if we look at borders yesterday and today, uh, we again have very different images uh, in front of us, and I could have picked very different ones. There, we have a whole collection of images now of borders and body politics due to the year 2015 where borders were opened and then closed again. Uh, but this is a iconic picture of the then Austrian uh, foreign minister and uh, the Hungarian minister uh, cutting through the wire between the Austrian and Hungarian border. That means that was the fall uh, and the end of the Iron Curtain. Uh, and that meant sort of reuniting Eastern, Eastern and Western Europe. So that was an enormous achievement, 1989. And of course now, if we look at those borders nowadays, they have been reconstructed. So uh, as you might know, Viktor Orban and Fides have now reconstructed a very firm border with lots of, uh, lots of uh, walls uh, to uh, keep refugees out. Uh, and in that way, there was a big scandal already 2016, because due to the refugee movement, uh, the then Austrian government was frightened that too many refugees would cross the border uh, between Austria and Italy and the South Tyrol, which is again iconic that you can now just pass through uh, these borders. And there were all these uh, soldiers already lined up to uh, reject uh, some refugees who would have wanted uh, to cross the mountains into Austria. That is also an, an important picture, a sort of uh, snapshot of the many refugees who wanted to come to Austria in September 2015 when the borders were actually opened. You might remember Angela Merkel's very famous utterance, wir schaffen das, uh, we can do it, which meant uh, we can take in the refugees. And at that point, uh, we had 10,000s of refugees every week passing through Vienna and through Austria, some of them remaining, some of them applying for asylum, uh, others traveling on to Germany and to Sweden. So basically, the three countries which had most of the refugees in the year 2015 were Austria, Germany, and Sweden. And of course, Greece, where many landed, Italy, where many landed already since many years, but that was never talked about, uh, and, but not in any of the other countries, not here and not uh, in Eastern Europe, and also very few in France. So it was basically one route which those refugees coming from Iraq, Iran, Syria, specifically Syria and Afghanistan took. And you see uh, the enormous industry now of border politics, which creates these uh, big walls and um, invests millions uh, of euros, pounds, or dollars in sustaining the territory. So there has been a big frame shift between welcoming and now rejecting uh, strangers, 
refugees. So the border has, a very, has very important meanings, and I really like this one definition by Deschen in his important book, where he says, variously invoked as a geographic term for delineating territories, the border is a political expression of national sovereignty, a juridical marker of citizen status, because you can pass or not pass due to your passport or visa or whatever uh, uh, status you have. And it is also an ideological trope for defining terms of inclusion and exclusion. So when can you stay and when do you have to leave? When are you allowed to come and when are you not allowed to come? So the border circulates as a spatial metaphor in the public vernacular. And that is what the debates were about 2015. They focused on opening and closing borders. Not so much in the UK, yeah, because you have the channel in between, and there were very few refugees coming here, uh, but very much so on the continent. So the questions for this lecture, and we also post them, of course, in the project, uh, are how have Austrian border and body politics changed since 1995? Are there specific movements, uh, changes in definitions in those three points of time which we investigated due to new challenges worldwide, like globalization, uh, like renationalizing tendencies, uh, new public spheres, new media, social media, etc. And how do these changing body and border politics interact with the construction of national identity? So these are the questions uh, for this longitudinal study. So just to tell you briefly a few sociolinguistic approaches, I'm actually a linguist and I was trained as a sociolinguist. That's why I also like doing ethnography and interviewing and field work and all of that. Um, in sociolinguistics, we've also had a spatial turn. So the borders have become a very interesting trope also in sociolinguistics, the same like in geography and in other disciplines, which is why interdisciplinarity makes so much sense in looking at the mediation of borders and uh, body politics. So uh, a lot of work has looked at borders as historically contingent social discursive constructions. How are they talked about? Uh, what kind of influence, how, how, what kind of impact do they have? For whom and when? Who is for closing the borders? Who's for opening the borders? Uh, then we have narratives of borders. What do people who live very close to each other but are only divided by borders, uh, like in Cyprus, for example, uh, or in other towns, like between Eastern and Western Europe, like Berlin used to be? What are the narratives about border crossings? How do they experience those borders? And there were many studies about that. Um, then there are questions about how othering focuses and is experienced. How is the person across the border uh, imagined? And there are very interesting studies by Ulrike Meinhof and others about, uh, again, crossing borders in towns where, which are divided uh, in the midst by borders. Uh, then we have a lot of rhetoric of securitization uh, due to terrorism and not, uh, of course, recently this terrible attack now in New Zealand. So how can we secure borders? How do we know who's coming in and who's not coming in? How can we re regulate the flow? Uh, and this is where, nowadays, the far right 
is leading in their rhetoric and also in their proposals. And finally, I think very interesting, the phenomenon of multilingualism and contact linguistics. So people who live on both sides of the borders learn many languages, but their languages are also influencing each other. Uh, and so we have a lot of interesting uh, shifts in language. Contact linguistics uh, is a really uh, very flourishing discipline right now. So in the sense of legitimizing and securitizing borders nowadays because of uh, refugees, because of migrants, because of terrorism, because of all these threats, uh, real threats or constructed threats, uh, we have politicians who need to legitimize uh, when they put up borders. And I think that Bastian Vollmer, who has studied uh, with Compass in Oxford, uh, the border politics in the UK a lot, and especially Calais and Dover, uh, has uh, come up with the term of the moralization of borders. That means there are certain people who deserve crossing the borders and others don't deserve crossing the borders. But who defines that? Who is the person or the group or the politician or the political party who defines when somebody is allowed to cross or not to cross the borders? And there's a lot of debate about who are the real asylum seekers. Are they illegal migrants or are they real asylum seekers? And how do we know that? So these debates have been uh, dominating the public sphere ever since 2000. 15. And I think that the narrative of deservingness is very important in this context. So who is the real asylum seeker? So what, what does this person have to have? Still one leg or two legs or wounded, tortured, not tortured? So how, when are these people believed uh, that they are really fleeing and that they deserve help? And I think that this debate is, uh, has become salient uh, nowadays. So coming to Austria now, to my case study, um, I first I want to show you that in 1995, 2005, and 2015, the people who were coming to Austria, sort of migrants and asylum seekers, were very different. And in each case, we had a big debate about inclusion and exclusion. Now, 2000, uh, 1995, there was a big uh, debate and already a petition by the far-right party, the Austrian Freedom Party, FPÖ, which is currently part of a coalition government and stands about at 24% in the opinion polls. Um, uh, at that time, 1995, that was relatively soon after the fall of the Iron Curtain, um, the people who were not wanted were the Eastern Europeans. So they, they, these people were talked about as you know, illegal migrants, economic migrants, they should stay home and build up their country, like we, the Austrians, build up our country. Of course, Austria had the help of the Marshall Fund, but uh, that was not mentioned frequently. The Eastern Europeans were very negatively stereotyped. We did a media study immediately, 1989-90, when the borders were opened, and a discourse of pity very quickly shifted into a discourse of exclusion, and specifically against Romanians and Poles. Uh, very stereotypically, Romanians were uh, imagined as dark and dangerous, uh, and Poles as thieves. So that was sort of the common stereotype uh, of the far right, and that was already dominating the news. Uh, at the same time, uh, 
there was also, uh, if you remember, the war on the Balkans. And there were refugees coming to Austria from Bosnia, about 90,000 refugees, and they were taken in. So that was not an issue. Uh, Austria sort of, they were integrated quite quickly. Many of them now have left uh, home and back again. But there was no big debate about Bosnians being Muslims or that it would be difficult to integrate them, uh, etc. So the problem as it was defined were the people coming from the East. Now 2005, suddenly the discourse changed completely. There was a discursive shift and it shifted towards the strangers inside Austria and the far right focused mainly on the Muslims. So the far right uh, party, which at that time was the black and blue coalition, the first grand coalition between conservatives and far right, uh, they were very adamant that they didn't want minarets to be built, that the, the headscarf debate started and there were uh, a vast amount of Islamophobic uh, utterances, slogans, etc., alongside also exclusionary rhetoric against Roma and against Jews. So all of this kind of merged together. But the Muslims were sort of the enemy, yeah, the stranger. And uh, 2015, Again, we have strangers coming from outside. Yes, so, uh, but this time, not the Eastern Europeans who are now part of the EU. In that way, there is freedom of movement. So they are, you know, just also Europeans. Uh, but the, the issue now are the refugees coming from far away from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and now they are talked about relative, in the relative similar ways like the Romanians and the Poles were talked about 1995. So the strategies and structures of the rhetoric is quite similar. Uh, you just have different minorities talked about. And the rhetoric of exclusion is very similar, the metaphors of being swamped and flooded uh, by foreigners, by migrants, by illegal migrants. And what has really changed now is that the German language competence has been focused upon. So if you want to stay in Austria, you have to learn German, you have to learn German very well. Otherwise, you don't get benefits at all. This is now a recent law where benefits are cut uh, if you don't know German on the level B2. Now, level B2 German, all people who know something about multilingualism would know, level B2 German is high school German, written and spoken. This is not just everyday conversation. This is already a very sophisticated level of German, and many Austrian native German speakers don't have B2. Uh, and they would probably fail those tests. Yeah? Uh, but, of course, they are not tested. But um, So German has become, and that means there is a shift to the uh, sort of cultural nation's uh, definition and not the state nation definition. So uh, we see that uh, these, the strangers can be very arbitrarily defined. They can change, uh, but there is always an other because we need obviously an other to define oneself. And that is the core of identity politics. You have similarity and difference. And uh, the, that can be negotiated, co-constructed, change. Uh, you can have multiple identities and, and so forth. They are context dependent, but it is part and parcel of political debates. 
So the case study now uh, where, where I want to take you to even a smaller context, namely 2015 now, uh, we had a multi-level analysis. I will not bore you with the linguistic details, but uh, we did use uh, a discourse strand, that means a debate which starts at a certain point and ends at a certain point, and that was the debate about opening and closing borders and about the number of refugees Austria could take in. So how many can we take in? When is the boat full? Yeah, that is basically the debate. We looked at different contexts in the debate, and uh, it's very interesting that there were power struggles over meanings. Who is the migrant? What is the border? How can we define this? And uh, we looked at the trajectory of certain terms and how they shifted due to political uh, imaginaries and ideologies. And as we had a lot, a huge data set, we don't do content analysis like many people do in media studies, we do corpus linguistics, which means we have certain software to uh, sort of mine through large data sets looking for keywords and collocations and similar. I'm happy to say more about that in the discussion if somebody wants to know more about this. So the year 2015 developed in a way which was completely unexpected and I can tell you that is very interesting when you do a project where you standardize certain things and then everything is different than you had thought it would be. So we had standardized that we would look at certain dates like the anniversary of the EU membership, the state <coughs> treaty, commemoration of liberation of uh, concentration camps, liberation uh, of uh, Nazi dictatorship, the November pogroms, certain dates which are standard in Austrian uh, commemorative tradition, and that's it. Yeah, and then we would collect the media debates, etc., speeches. But the year developed completely differently, and as you might remember, the year started with the attacks in Paris on Charlie Hebdo. And uh, that was sort of the trigger for already debates about Muslims, migrants, strangers, and uh, danger. Uh, so it was Charlie Hebdo, then the kosher supermarket, then uh, the referendum in Greece started, and uh, very important, uh, 71 refugees were found suffocated in a truck very close to Vienna. So the crisis had arrived in Austria and very close in Central Europe. Uh, you will also remember Alan Kurdi, who was found dead on the beach. Uh, but his father was carrying this small boy, and that was a picture which traveled through the world and went viral. And then we had the famous Merkel saying with uh, Wir schaffen das, uh, we can do, make it, uh, when refugees went by foot through the night from the train station in Budapest to the Austrian border. Women, children, barefoot, with nothing but just a plastic, uh, something to carry some food or something. Um, and then Austria suddenly, and also that was planned, had four regional elections that year that meant that the political parties were campaigning all year. So you had the sort of reporting about the refugee crisis, you had reporting about the Greek crisis, which was also then, and the Eurozone crisis, and at the same time you had the political parties campaigning for seats in regions and regional governors. And that meant they 
uh, had to define their strategies. What would they do? And apart from Vienna, in all three other elections, they decided to accommodate to the far right and say, we don't want the asylum seekers. We don't want the refugees, except in Vienna. And interestingly, in Vienna, the far right didn't win. And in the other parts of Austria, the far right won enormously because it doesn't work. You cannot overtake the far right on the right. Uh, people still vote for the far right and they don't vote for the parties which shift their opinions. That, that is not trustworthy. So it doesn't make sense to accommodate uh, to the far right policies. Then, if you remember, there was the terrorist attack again in Paris, Bataclan, where uh, over 100 people were killed in a, at a music festival. And that already shifted the atmosphere very strongly in the sense of these strangers are dangerous. In all cases, these were migrants and they were born in France or had lived there already for a long time. They were not part of these asylum seekers, but there was a general shift already of fear, a lot of fear. And finally, uh, and I guess many of you will remember, there were sexual assaults in Cologne on the 31st of December, and that triggered a complete frame shift. From then on, everybody, the media were adamant that borders had to be closed, uh, that our women were in danger, and uh, we had to keep them out. Now, interestingly, again, as far as we know, in Cologne, they, again, these were not refugees and not asylum seekers, but migrants who had already lived there for a long time. But that didn't matter. Stranger was stranger. Yeah? And there was a complete merging of lexical items. So uh, our data, just to show you that briefly, uh, we had over 8,000 texts on the, in the Austrian media, and we looked at two discourse strands, one on building a border fence, pro and con, and how would you define border fence, and different words were played with, and every word sort of condensed a certain political position. So, uh, border, or Zaun or Grenzzaun was used by different political parties. And the same was true for the maximum limit for asylum seekers. The, uh, the left said there should be a limit which one would aim at, but one should be flexible and Richtwert, yeah, sort of a sort of possible limit. And the right, political right said we have to have a maximum limit and not one over this limit should be taken in. And so the debates were about words, but actually they were about positions uh, condensed in those words. So we had a big amount of newspaper and magazine articles and uh, I don't want to bore you now with details and just show you how we analyzed that. And over the months from April to February where these debates were ongoing, and finally in February there was a law which decided that Austria can just take in 37,500 refugees a year, um, and the Balkan route was closed. Uh, that meant refugees coming from Greece could not enter over Hungary and come or Slovenia and come to Austria. The route was closed. Um, you see that looking through these texts, these debates had peaks. They had peaks in September, that was when the borders were opened, and they had peaks in November, that was Bataclan. So you see that the debates were enormous and really hot debates, always dependent on such events. 
whereas the debates about the upper limit were quite slow and only in January after the sexual harassment assaults, they started to converge with the debate about uh, the fence or the wall. So to just show you uh, the way this was legitimized and argued for, uh, one term became salient, Fortress Europe. Now Fortress Europe is an old term, was actually used by the Nazis in World War II, then also by the Allied forces. Then it was used in the Cold War, and now it's being reused again against sort of fortifying, protecting Europe. And the then vice chancellor from the right wing, sort of Tory-like party said, Europe is being rebuilt as the fortress Europe. This is now the aim. We have to protect uh, the continent. And he was supported by the Minister of Interior Affairs. There's nothing bad about a fence. So very rational, legitimizing ways, very rational arguments. Whereas the then Social Democratic Labour Party Chancellor said, I don't want a Europe of fence building competitions. So you had a total polarization in the debate and in the media and every day there was more about fences and walls and <laughs> fortress and that was sort of uh, the topic of the debate. There was also a lot of analogies, historical analogies that made in this media debate. Uh, and for example, again, uh, the then chancellor from the left who said, who was uh, uh, in a big conflict with the Hungarians because Austria had opened the borders, the Hungarians wanted to close the borders, so uh, that was already Orban. And he said, the way the Hungarians are treating asylum seekers, that's not the way. But above all, it is unacceptable that refugees are coming from Hungary in fear, panic, starving, and partly traumatized. When trains that are meant to lead to freedom are suddenly diverted into camps, and that is what happened in Hungary, and the asylum seekers were not told where the trains were going to, which is really an analogy uh, to very dark times and the uh, deportations to concentration camps, then I'm reminded of dark times in our history. And then he's, Feynman, the then chancellor, said, we acted differently, and this is now the Austrian we, we as Austrians, identity, uh, during the Hungarian crisis, 1956, and put little red, white, red flags on the border to take away the fear of the people who were fleeing. Just to remind you, 1956, the Soviet Union invaded Hungary, and about 150,000 Hungarians fled to Austria and were welcomed. And that was a time, post-war, where Austria was still very poor, was just being rebuilt, and uh, not comparable to this very rich country which it is now. Namely, I think Austria is the fifth richest country in the world. So there's no fear of, you know, um, that the boat is really full. So when we looked at all these texts and did a word cloud uh, via this software using, uh, looking through the media text, we saw that the word which was used most in all the media debates was border. That really stuck out and then a lot of composita with border. So everything which is concerned with border, border security, border wall, border closing, uh, all the details of uh, sort of the building of borders uh, were uh, used enormously, uh, whereas everything which was concerned with inside Austria was not really talked about a lot. So basically, they were supposed to be stopped here. And that was sort of the message which was uh, conveyed by the media. 
Now, my, my second discursive strand, uh, setting a maximum limit, which was again sort of metonymically used by both positions, maximum limit or just kind of a standard which one could reach but which was flexible. And again, we had different arguments uh, and uh, legitimation devices one cannot reduce a fundamental human right to a specific number, that was the then president, a social democrat, and then say everyone beyond that number is out of luck. So it's impossible, we are part of the Geneva Treaty and you cannot refuse refugees to come. Uh, and the same was true, there can be no upper limit on humanitarianism, so that was the one position. The other position was uh, already in Hungary, our borders have come under danger, our lifestyle built upon respect for the law is in danger, Hungary and all of Europe are in danger. And that was, as my book is called, the politics of fear. There was enormous threat and fear, panic provoked by the media reporting, by these politicians, and more specifically, what I call the culturalization. That means it is not anymore about saving lives uh, or economic arguments like it costs too much money or some rational debate. It was they are different, they don't fit here. Uh, their culture is different and that's why they're dangerous. And suddenly it was all about the Austrian lifestyle, the lifestyle in Hungary could get lost, the Austrian culture and social order would be undermined. And really interesting is why this culturalization has been instrumentalized by the politics and the media, very much because it's the fear of losing elections. And Orban, uh, on Christmas uh, 24th December 2015, said in a speech, according to available surveys, the large majority of immigrants, not refugees, immigrants, will be left-wing voters. So that's what he's afraid of. We must clearly understand that the person who has come from Islam will not vote for a Christian-based party. So that's impossible that they would vote for the right. The traditional political balance of our continent will be overturned. So it's a political fear. It's a fear of losing elections, not so much sort of the more, much more superficial cultural fear and the culturalization. But in that way, we had a complete frame shift from welcoming refugees, the so-called Willkommenskultur, to rejecting refugees, from welcome to fear and danger, and from refugees to illegal immigrants. And sort of it was a shift in attitude, a shift in news media reporting, and a lexical shift. Sort of there are new and different words used to talk about it. So that is the frame shift. In 2015, migrants and refugees are associated with hardship, hunger, poverty, fleeing, uh, needing help. This is what we can do with corpus linguistics and collocation analysis. In April, they become associated with terrorism and radical Islam. In July, there is a lot of debate about violence and fraud, smugglers bringing refugees. In September, they are victims of smugglers, but also a lot of ungrateful. So they don't deserve it because they don't thank us enough, which uh, is interesting to know what, what people expected. What would those refugees do when they come, what, what would have been enough? Uh, in November, then, the association with terrorism is reinforced, and in January and February, they become associated with rape, assault, and criminality, 
And that means from then on, they're all criminal. It's a complete criminalization of strangers, which we can see in sort of the bulk of the media with very few exceptions. So I come to my conclusions. Um, what I've tried to show you in this brief summary of a lot of analysis and a three-year project plus a longitudinal comparison is that threat scenarios related to border and body politics are quite a constitutive element of national identity constructions. But they can change. They can change uh, who is sort of deserving and non-deserving, and who is threatening us. And that is an interesting shift. So 1995, that was people coming from the former Eastern Bloc and the former communist countries, which are now completely integrated in Austria. And uh, uh, part and parcel, I mean, um, if you look at the phone book in Vienna, uh, I think you will find very few really Germanic names, yeah? because also because of the uh, long tradition of the monarchy. And uh, Vienna was always a cosmopolitan city. So that has been integrated. 2005, we suddenly have a focus on Islam. And that was when the far-right party very strategically decided who should they really attack? Who should be the focus and how would they get more voters on board? Up to 2005, Muslims were not really people who were framed or attacked in that way by a political party. And Islam has always been part of Austrian history. There was a law already at the beginning of the 20th century integrating Islam. So that was not something which was talked about. It was a conscious decision to target one minority group. And in that way, to establish a division, a cleavage inside the society. Uh, of course, following on 9-11. Yeah? So there were global uh, incidents and events which influenced uh, that development. And 2015, it's again those coming from outside who are so different. And the rhetoric is very similar uh, in the way 1995, the people coming from the Eastern European countries were targeted. Uh, so criminal, lazy, uh, dark, uh, etc. What is important, what we have seen in our data is that migrants and refugees, those two categories have merged completely. And no distinctions are made even in, in uh, very good quality broadsheets. No distinction is made between different kinds of migrants and migration. Uh, quite the opposite, one talks now only about illegal migrants. And even in the uh, coalition government's program, which they announced at the beginning of this new government, the term refugee doesn't appear anymore they only talk or write about illegal migrants. Now, we consulted with lawyers and human rights activists, what is an illegal migrant? Uh, who, who is this? Yeah, how do you define an illegal migrant? And the answer is very interesting. An illegal migrant is someone is a refugee or an asylum seeker who has been denied asylum, could return because the country now is esteemed safe. So they could return where they came from, but they decide to stay 
and then they're illegal, yeah, because they have remained illegally in the country, although they were denied uh, to stay, and they were able to go back, because you cannot send people back to countries which are not safe. So it's all interesting legal issues. So the term illegal migrant is now a really negative word, sort of at referring to everybody you don't want in that country. And I remember uh, we did a big study when I was at Lancaster, 10 years, uh, British newspapers, um, national newspapers, everything, tabloids and up to the Financial Times. And the categories of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants were also merged, even in newspapers like The Guardian. Uh, the only newspaper which made very clear distinction was the Financial Times. It's quite interesting. Um, and we published that study some, some years ago. Uh, interesting for Austria also is that Germany always remains uh, the other for Austria, uh, and in different ways. So, on the one hand, it's the big neighbor, of course, and there is a long history with Germany, of course. On the other hand, Merkel was very much admired, uh, 2015, and now, uh, in this debate about borders and refugees, she has become the absolute other. Uh, so, the bad uh, refugee policy is identified with Merkel and then blamed on the EU. Now that's also interesting and I guess uh, many people here can identify with these debates. Whenever something bad happens, the EU is blamed. Whenever something good happens, one achieved that in the EU uh, because we're all part of the EU. So everything which is decided in the EU is a decision of all heads of government. Everybody is part of that. The EU is not separate. But that is the way the debate is framed. And finally, what has really become salient and very different in this longitudinal perspective is German language policies. They have become the absolute obstacle, the gatekeeper. You have to overcome that obstacle, otherwise you cannot stay in Austria or you don't get enough money to be able to eat uh, and you don't get a working permit. Um, and that has become much stricter than it used to be. So in conclusion, I see that all these tendencies as a normalization of drive, what I call driving on the right, sort of accommodating the right. Uh, what we do see is that there is no way that you can close borders and keep European or global events outside. Of course they impact on the national politics. There is no way that you can just look at small territories and protect them by closing the borders. What we also saw and has become even more salient since 2015 is that struggle about words manifest ideological struggles. And the shorter communication gets, the more tweets we have, the more the struggle about words uh, is to be observed. Yeah, because there are no long arguments. So you fight about words. It's actually quite plausible, but it was nevertheless surprising. We have the moralization of borders, ever more uh, views of refugees as commodities, which one sort of shifts around and, uh, you know, they can stay there or they have to go there and uh, they are quite dehumanized. And what I talked about at the end, the culturalization, the argument of people don't fit here has become the most salient uh, argument uh, in Austria and in all Visegrad countries, in Central Europe, it's the most salient argument. So to sum up, I would say 
tensions between globalizing econo economic, social, and cultural developments and exclusionary identity politics lead to reinventing nationalism. And this is what we are experiencing today. There are huge, very forceful tensions between, on the one hand, everything is global, especially communication and media, and on the other hand, ever more tendencies to protect the nation, our language, our heritage, and so forth, as if that would be possible in this globalizing world. So to end, I would just like to show you one of my favorite pictures by a Turkish artist, where I think this is the way we should actually see borders in the future. Perhaps such times would be possible again, where we can have a much more relaxed attitude and uh, not have the feeling of building walls and fortresses as the most important part of politics. Thank you very much. Microphone that is being offered so that, to you. Austrians are, are proud of their that they use other words than people like me uh, from the north. Um, and but but at the end, the, I think the test is a standardized German, isn't it? And that's that's closer to the German that uh, yeah. I, I grew up with. So is, is there also that would you say there is a shift? Um, uh, absolutely. Well, there is a, as one part of our project, we also look at this so-called Austrian German, where there are big debates about if that exists or not, if it's a dialect, a variety, and so forth, in contrast to German-German. Uh, and of course, there are syntactic and lexical differences, but this was not what I talked about now. The, the Germanness now and the gatekeeping function of German is standard German. Uh, so it's not speaking dialect and not conversation, but really, B2 level and C1, even if one wants to go further uh, high school or even uh, further education level. So that would be Dudendeutsch, yeah, and, and absolutely. But it's a very interesting, and we did big studies about this development post-war of Austrian German and Austria having its own dictionary for Austrian German and so forth as a way of distinction to Germany. Thanks, uh, that was great, enjoyed it very much. Um, there's been an argument that and, and a lot of this comes up when people talk about social democratic parties in Europe, that there has been a move from talking about economics being salient political issues to culture and, and to identity. And during your, your sort of longitude and that longitudinal analysis, did you notice any shifts um, of that kind? Were, were there different balances between, between the way migrants or refugees were talked about? Uh, you mean now only on the left or both? Either. Either, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even in that one year, there was a shift from more economic arguments. Uh, we, we, don't have en uh, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough budget, we don't have enough asylum homes, we don't have this, yeah, the boat is full, as sort of framing metaphor, to then the culturalization and the securitization. So there was, even in this one year, that shift, but I remember very well in our study about 1989-90, when we studied the discourse about Romanians, Poles and Hungarians and Czechs, uh, there was the shift uh, very much from the 
debate in the trade unions that they will uh, take our jobs away. So that was the big issue and uh, much legitimate fear about dumping salaries uh, because they were not part of the EU yet. So they, were, they could have been cheap labor. So that was primarily one focus uh, to then again, they don't fit here, they're dark, uh, they look different. Uh, Romanians were said to look different and there was a very similar fear that Romanian young men would rape the Austrian women like now with the asylum seekers. So there is this uh, shift both on the right and the left. Um, but the humanitarian arguments actually are mostly on with the green parties and the left and the church. Uh, so the Catholic church, Austria is predominantly Catholic, although it's becoming more and more secular. Uh, but the many charities are uh, religious charities. The church has been adamant and frequently in opposition to the government, which is quite interesting. Thank you. Of course, first of all, thank you. And thank you for the type of work you've been doing for years and years and years provides a deep historical contextualization for current discussions. So it prevents us from having something that's very sort of what's sexy now and seeing this teleological argument that you bring forth. Um, I have a little bit of a comparative question. So at the time, you, you mentioned in 2015 this myth of the replacement myth that is now becoming so prominent in conversations around the world. Um, and I noticed that, for example, when, when we talk about the refugee crisis, we constantly talk about Germany and Austria, Hungary, different countries in the uh, European Union that are struggling with this. But if we look at replacement, I mean, Lebanon's population now is one in five Syrian. Uh, Jordan took in far more than either either Germany or um, or Austria. So a little bit of what do you think as a linguist? What do you think? Like what are the factors that you're seeing that make it so much of a crisis in one place that in another place is treated exactly like that guy? I mean, it's not all peaches and honey. It's all not all great, but you don't see Lebanon propagating the type of discourse that you are seeing in Austria. Yeah, that is a. I think a very good question and it's, I think it doesn't have an easy answer. I think that there is uh, one, one level is of course uh, neighborly help. So the people fleeing from Syria, uh, where are the first places they go? Um, they might have friends, relatives, whatever there are organizations there which help. Uh, so there is much less fear of strangers. Um, I think that is important. Uh, also, there were, at that time, organizations in place to help from the United Nations. I think what really uh, was a terrible decision was to cut in half, almost, the support that many countries gave to the United Nations to help these refugees. And so, uh, they, had, they didn't have enough money to feed their kids. So of course, if you want to have a perspective for the young generation, then you decide to, to move, if it's possible. So uh, that really, if, if there would have been help there on a much bigger scale, I think that would have been resolved in very different ways. Also, there are millions of refugees in Turkey uh, who have been taken and then the deal of Merkel with Turkey to help Greece. So there is a certain attitude in Europe as almost as a whole, except uh, that these refugees were threatening and then in different ways. Uh, so you had a very different attitude in Greece and Italy and uh, if you had heard interviews with mayors in Lampedusa or in certain towns in Italy and Sicily where the boats arrived or on the Greek islands, people really helped. Uh, but then 
you know, they were stuck because there was not enough uh, food, there were not enough resources, etc. And the EU, that means the other countries, didn't send money down there. So that was a huge problem and that made the arrival so terribly difficult. And that meant they started moving north. And that's when this fear started and the far right parties with their ideology of protecting Christian Europe. And as the far right is rising and is rising all the time, and uh, Poland and Hungary have such governments and Austria has a coalition government of that kind, etc. You have uh, this ideology now of protecting Christian Europe from these invasions. And it has become a ideological struggle uh, because it's not about resources, because there would be enough resources. That's, that's certainly not the issue in the rich countries uh, and the, the former Eastern Bloc countries have not taken in any anyway. I think Poland has taken in nine refugees or something like that, or the Czech Republic has taken none. So there is a really anti-Muslim sentiment without Muslims being there, yeah, like anti-Semitism without Jews. It's very similar to now anti Muslim sentiments without Muslims. Uh, so there is difference, context-dependent differences in inside Europe, I think. And then it depends which, what is the local um, population. And that's interesting in France, for example, where you had the Algerian war, you have a lot of post-colonial uh, traditions, which is again different to Central Europe. So there would be much to talk about, but I think it's become a strong ideological issue because the resources are there. It's no question. Um, thank you very much for this very stimulating lecture. Um, can I say what I think about what this suggests about nationalism. Intuitively, one might think that countries want to exclude people so they build walls. I think the logic of nationalism is that you build walls and then you have to find somebody to exclude and you have to find a reason to exclude them. The, the logic, the inherent logic of nationalism is you have to morally denigrate the other side of the wall and the people who are, who are over it. And I think that in terms of your cultural analysis, this is what you showed. And I found that very significant. Which is the country in Europe where there are more walls than anywhere else? It's a rhetorical question. It's the United Kingdom. In Northern Ireland now, there are 108 walls, mm, uh, which, are, which are referred to as peace walls, which are locked up every day, preventing one community going into another community, only unlocked at night when, during a, a, a period of curfew. And interestingly, the British government two years ago said it would reduce the, it, would, it would close down the peace walls in Northern Ireland. At that time, there were 96 peace walls. There are now 108. Uh, so there are more of them than there were when they decided to close them down. And exactly the same principle of nationalism exists. You build the wall and you find a reason. In exactly the same way as you were saying about accents, uh, you will be able to tell me who said this. Um, uh, 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 a language is a dialect with an army border. Mm. Uh, this is a, uh, the creation of an institution that then can support a kind of toxic nationalist ideology. Yeah, thank you very much. Interest, yeah. Very, I mean, especially I had no clue that there were so many walls in Ireland. I knew about 
you know, you see the pictures, but that there were 103? 108. I went to look at, I went and look at 80 of them last weekend. Wow. <laughs> so maybe Donald Trump had his idea from there. Yeah. Great, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm interested in resistance. Uh, so did you find points of emergence of counter narratives of resistance to the far right in your research? And if so, did you identify any useful strategies if deployed more strategically into the centrifuge of, of rhetoric of the far right might have been able to compete uh, with these growing far right narratives? Uh, well, we did find counter-narratives, and uh, I did show you this humanitarian argument. That was a very strong counter-narrative, and civil society as such was sort of materialized as a counter-narrative, because uh, if you imagine that 10,000s of people arrived every week, uh, at the train stations in Vienna and in Salzburg and then in M Munich and so forth, uh, you probably saw the pictures of, you know, just everybody rushing there, bringing food, bringing clothes, uh, helping uh, translators, you know, just people who by chance coincidentally knew various languages like Farsi or Arabic or so, just went there and helped translate, etc. So the civil society, a huge part, uh, much more than the sort of usual suspects of very progressive greens or students and so forth, were up on their feet. Uh, and in that way, you had a sort of um, material uh, counter-narrative. Uh, and they also staged uh, big music festivals. In Vienna had, I think, two big music festivals, mus music for human rights and so forth, with 10,000s of people also uh, collecting funds and so forth. So that was sort of the polarization. Uh, but it didn't sort of, on the long term, it didn't work out. Even the tabloids for a time were on that side, especially after Alan Kurdi and, and the terrible pictures of drowned children and so forth. So that was unanimous, basically. Uh, but it turned with the terrorist uh, incidents in Paris, yeah, Bataclan was, and then with the, the attacks on women. And the far right, that was instrumentalized, yeah? That's not now sort of denigrating or mitigating, that was terrible, but it was instrumentalized to reactivate uh, the sort of threat and fear and uh, really raised a, a panic, yeah? It was sort of people were saying, do we all have to buy pepper sprays now and how do we walk on which streets and, you know, it was, really creating panic. Uh, and then the counter-narrative didn't work anymore. So uh, now there are new, there are narratives, of course, and human rights organizations are still up and about, but the far right has won elections. And I think that makes it so much more difficult. So um, in Austria anyway, yeah, not in Germany, uh, and Germany is quite polarized, uh, and um, in the, the debates are dominated very much by now the far right in Hungary, Poland, France. So I think the European elections will be a really tipping point. Uh, who will, well, that would come back to your studies, yeah, about uh, who will vote for for the far right and how many percent will they get. Uh, the estimate now is about 20% for the extreme right, the far right. Uh, but of course, nobody knows also what impact Brexit will have. Yeah, there are so many factors which are unpredictable right now. 
So no recipe, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, it's not my territory to discuss analysis, so uh, I don't wish to make a point, but seek some clarification. I found it interesting that um, you mentioned commemorative events, and 45 is commemorated as liberation from Nazism. Yeah. Um, is, uh, I want to follow that. I mean, certainly when I interviewed uh, Jewish exiles, Paul Lazarsfeld, uh, Hans Seitzel, Paul Neurath, they didn't see it as liberation from Nazism. They actually saw defeat of Nazism. Now, what puzzles me here is that the national story that Austria tells itself, that it was liberated from Nazism? Because if that is the case, surely it pulls the rest of the story in a different way from that which it pulls in Germany, where Merkel clearly sees themselves as defeated and sees a, a sense of guilt and shapes her attitude uh, to, to, to immigration. It's a point of clarification. I, but I am surprised that, that is the, if that's the national story. Well, there are quite a few national stories. There's not just one. And um, I would say, well, trying to make it brief. Uh, Austria, after 1945, uh, was able to define itself as victim, the first victim of the Nazis. And that was declared in the so-called Moscow Declaration 1943, which was signed by the Allied forces. Uh, so Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt, and they signed that, and that meant that after, for, if the Nazis would be defeated, Austria would be declared as the first victim. Well, we all know the real story, uh, but um, there was also a second part in this Moscow Declaration, which said, but Austria's, Austrians also have to take responsibility for what happened. So that was always denied. Yeah, that second part was not talked about. Uh, so uh, basically, after 1945, the sort of hegemonic narrative became, we were the first victim. Uh, we were occupied by the Nazis. Unfortunately, Hitler was Austrian, but you know, uh, so, okay, then there was a lot of silence. I'm being quite cynical now, but I've uh, analyzed a lot and also written some books about, about this sort of narratives of the past. The big tipping point in Austria was not like in Germany in 1968, but uh, the Waldheim Affair in 1986. Uh, and that, for the first time, uh, made it possible to talk about the participation of many, many hundred thousands of Austrians in Nazi war, Germany, crimes, etc. Uh, and uh, sort of school books then changed, the whole narrative changed, also officially, uh, by the then chancellor and the then president, not Waldheim, but later on. And since then, there are basically at least two narratives. There's a more revisionist narrative, which means we were defeated. So people still identifying with Nazism, and the far right has such elements. And then there is the sort of democratic republic, which says we were liberated uh, by the Soviets, basically, Vienna. Uh, sorry? Yeah. Uh, and then there is sort of the, the narrative, well, um, the, the Nazis in Austria lost and the others won. And if one knows, Austria had 700,000 members of the NSDAP and denazification was not a big thing. So the war criminals, the big war criminals were imprisoned, there were a few trials, but uh, not comparable to Germany. So there's lots to talk about. And in that way, for our generation, it's very important to say that we were liberated because, well, I w I'm a, a child of refugees. So in that way, um, it's very important to state uh, that actually um, the, the allies won 
and the, the Nazis lost. And so that is that narrative, which, which is very much endorsed, but which is also endorsed now in many school books. But it's still a struggle between a more revisionist and a different kinds of histories. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jay, it's your turn now for some concluding remarks. Please bear with us, if you can, for a few more minutes. Wow, what a feast we've been treated tonight to a brilliant lecture presenting the results of a splendidly um, organized specimen of social science research. I can't possibly do justice to the, the um, this subject matter that's been opened up so tremendously tonight. So forgive me if um, I sort of venture a bit from left field. Um, as you all no doubt know, March 20th today is International Happiness Day. <laughs> and you may ask, why was this event scheduled, um, was it deliberately or accidentally scheduled on this date? Um, I'm personally certainly blessed and therefore also happy uh, to have had an annual series of lectures delivered in my name here. And I've been made particularly happy by tonight's lecture and our distinguished lecturer. Let me sort of explain briefly. I have enjoyed and found interesting all the lectures in this series so far. But it's from the contents of tonight's lecture and also Ruth's uh, corpus of published scholarship that more or less uniquely, I have learned something truly important. My own empirical research career has included studies of the political effects of mass communication, relationships between journalists and politicians, comparative cross-national analysis of media systems, and the uses and gratifications sought and derived by audience members from media consumption. But I now realize uh, that, there, that Ruth has put a finger on something which underlines, underlines, and underlies, sorry, and shapes and influences many of these processes. The struggles over meanings expressed in words and debates in the way she has articulated. So she's convinced me that um, this aspect uh, of the things we study must really be um, uh, built into our thinking about our subject. And I also want to say how <coughs> I resonated to um, the normative thrust of the concluding chapter of a book on the politics of prayer. Um, in these fluid times, and in these times when there's such ongoing debates as she's shown, it's important to have our finger on that normative crux, which she puts forward as the conflict between a politics of denial 
exclusiveness and fear as against a politics of uh, solidarity, inclusiveness, and hope. And I guess it's incumbent on all of us who are aware of that conflict to do and think however best we can to strengthen the resources uh, and the opportunities at the disposal of the politics of hope. So I thank you, Ruth, heartily for all that, as I'm sure all of you who have attended this memorable event uh, will do as well. It's therefore my great pleasure to move a vote of thanks for your stellar contribution to us tonight. Thank you. Now, as some of you may have expected, uh, it's under, uh, it doesn't stop here. Um, now, I understand that gifts, and she's given us a gift, should be reciprocal. And tradition obliges me to try to return your gift, Ruth, musically. I've therefore concocted a ditty for you to sing at the first session of uh, any class you may be teaching, if you're still teaching, of course, introducing students to yourself and your subject's core concepts. My adapted source of this effort is the operators, not of Vienna, <laughs> but of Gilbert and Sullivan. I don't know whether you're familiar with them. Um, which always included an autobiographical patter song describing the character's career path. And in the Pirates of Penzance, Major General Stanley's tale went like this, and pardon the imperfections of my attempt to reproduce all this. So his version went, I am the very model of a modern major general. I've information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England, and I quote the fights historical from Marathon to Waterloo, or in order categorical. I'm very well acquainted, too, with matters mathematical. I understand equations, both the simple and cadetical. About binomial theorems, I'm brimming with a lot of news. A lot of news, a lot of news. I've got it. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. Well, trying to adapt that for your uh, class's introduction, it might go something like this. And pardon my, I, I'm not up to Gilbert's rhymes and scanning. <clears throat> I've got the very model of meanings, rhetoric, and discourse. I'll bring a, a lingo for you to learn quite well in discourse. <laughs> like endoxins, metonymic, not a gimmick, and also topoi, <laughs> plus doublethink, ambivalence, and about, oh, sorry, uh, 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 sorry, multimodal argumentums, exclusionary, oh boy. <laughs> Plus double think ambivalence and also ever habitus. All these will soon inspire and must surely then grab at us. After lectures from myself, Emerita Ruth Wodak. Wodak? Kodak? Slow track, throwback, ah, I've got it, <laughs> of insights, truth, and knowledge, there will then be no lack. Thank you very much.
Okay, we never failed to entertain in the school. <laughs> and now you all deserve um, the reception outside, so please make your way out to the foyer.